Um, welcome everyone uh, to the April 2020 um, LabCorp session. Um, this comes at a time when the world is facing possibly the biggest public health challenge uh, in the recent history. COVID-19 has taken us all by surprise and we continue to react uh, naturally uh, as we react to COVID-19, some of the facilities that we are using for normal routine uh, uh, purposes have been repurposed. Uh, and so are the resources like financial resources and staff uh, that are being repurposed to this emergency. But this does not mean the existing public health problems have not disappeared. And from the perspectives of communicable diseases. Diseases like HIV, um, diseases like HIV, um, malaria are still with us and are not uh, rising. In fact, some of the measures that have been employed for um, COVID-19, like staying at home, have a negative impact on the access to scheduled testing and care for uh, HIV uh, and, uh, and TB. Thus, we saw it helpful uh, today that this session focuses on maintaining uh, HIV and TB testing in the context of uh, COVID-19. So a few logistics. Uh, we will have two sets of presentations today. Um, we have WHO and PEPFA, and then followed by questions and answers. We'll begin um, with a few remarks from uh, Meg, uh, from WHO, hopefully she has joined. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a presentation from uh, two colleagues from WHO, uh, as well as uh, from uh, PEPFA. Uh, so by way of starting, um, uh, Lara, do you know if uh, Meg is now online? Lara, can you hear me? Hello, can anybody hear me? Can hear you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so our first presenter uh, today uh, is uh, Dr. Lara uh, Vodinov who is the Diagnostic Advisor uh, in the HIV, TB, and Hepatitis uh, uh, from uh, the WHO uh, office headquarters in, in Geneva. Uh, over to you, Lara. Great. Thank you. I think now uh, we've fixed the unmuting issue. Uh, I'm trying to s uh, share my slides, and I know um, our new director, Meg Doherty, is on the line uh, to start with some opening comments uh, on the COVID response and epidemic in general. So, um, Nanafi, can you perhaps load up our slides? Uh, I can't seem to be able to do so from here. Or okay, let me uh, try to do that for you. Just a second. Let me know when you can see the slides. Um, can you please, sorry, take a quick peek. I just sent the updated version to you. Or else if it's possible to allow me to share my screen. Sure, please share your screen. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't been able to, I'm sorry. There may be okay. an issue with- uh, Stop the scare, screen sharing, you can go ahead and share. Sorry about these technical challenges. If it's possible, can you unmute Meg? And I, I um, am still struggling with sharing the screen. So perhaps Anafi, if you're able to do so, um, that would be okay. ideal. Apologies. That's okay. <laughs> Be fine now. 
Can you try and reshare now? Laura, I'm unmuted and can you see my screen for just yeah. intro's comments? We can, we can. Um, but this uh, we see also your preview slides. So kind of okay. I will change that. It's always can you see the full version now? Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm just, thank you very much. I'm, uh, apologies, I was muted uh, and couldn't uh, join right away. But um, thank you for having us in WHO for this really important topic. And thank you for Laura for asking me to provide a few over, overarching comments. Just to say uh, that you, you know everybody is following this, um, the COVID outbreak online at every way uh, possible. And for WHO, um, we have many databases, both at headquarters and in the regions, that give up regular up-to-date um, slide information. And we know we have now two and a half million uh, confirmed cases, and nearly 170,000 deaths over two, 210 countries. So definitely a pandemic affecting uh, the world at large. And this slide just shows that where the the greatest uh, regional uh, number of cases are, and certainly it's being primarily driven at this moment in time from the Americas um, and in yellow and Europe in, in orange. I think we were very much in, expecting to see a real takeoff in Africa, and although and they seem to have done an excellent job, and this comes from the WHO Afro dashboard, but certainly the most cases are being seen, as you know, in South Africa and Northern Africa, but uh, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, excellent public health measures being put in place. And, um, and we hope that it will be maintained um, as a relatively containable and mitigatable uh, outbreak without having the exponential growth we've seen across Europe and, um, and in the Americas. Just in terms of what is the relationship between COVID, HIV and TB, I, I think there's more to be learned and there's more and more data coming out about co-infection with HIV and the most recent from Spain and people living with HIV looks pre predominantly uh, reassuring, but we, we need to have more information. And I won't speak to TB because I know my colleagues will, but the, there is a concern that both TB and comorbidities of diabetes put people uh, with uh, at risk and, and also people living with HIV have many comorbidities as well. I'll skip through this, but just to know that WHO is really following also the, 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 di the, the drugs and have been looking at whether antiretrovirals and, um, would have a benefit. And we're looking forward to the outcomes from the very large more than 90 country solidarity trial that is going to be looking at four different drug regimens. I just want to point you to, because this is a lab group, that we have several resources on laboratory guidance, shipping, and I think you're, I've been watching and listening to your ASLM sessions, and they're fantastic in terms of giving the practical guidance about scaling up um, testing and how to do that. Lastly, what we're all concerned about for Africa and low and middle income countries is how do we maintain those essential services in the context of, um, COVID, and I think the diagnostics are certainly just one part of those. And with that, I think I will pass over to Laura. Um, uh, I stop sharing. And that was just my introduction that I really benefited from tapping into the ASLM lectures. I privately get on and listen and learn. And I think this is a fantastic modality to ensure that everybody around Africa in different regions are getting the same information at the same time and uh, that we're in this, this effort together to try to both test, diagnose, and keep people alive. So I'm just going to listen ad uh, urgently and uh, clearly during the next uh, hour. So thank you very much for having us. Back to you. Thank you very much, Meg, um, for, for the introduction. Um, so we go on to our next presenter, um, Dr. Lara Fojnov, uh, the Diagnostic Advisor in the HIV 
uh, TB and, uh, um, and SDI department uh, from who? Lara, over to you. Great. Thank you, Anafi. Uh, for some reason, I'm still unable to share my screen. So if you don't mind putting up our slides, uh, that would be very helpful. All right. Um, Great. Thank you. Let me check if I have the, the latest version. Uh, Either one will work well. Okay. All right. So. Excellent. So as Meg said, you know, one of our considerations within the HIV space, space and I know my um, my colleague, Dr. Dennis Falzon, will speak to this, touch on this afterwards, thinking about uh, diagnostics considerations in the, for tuberculosis in particular. Um, but within HIV, I think there are a lot of, as Anafi hinted at, some cohesions between the two and the different types of technologies um, that are utilized within both the HIV and the COVID space. So if you can move down a little bit, Anafi, um, continue. Continue, please. Keep going. And there we go. Next slide. Um, first, we want to touch a little bit on service delivery in general within HIV. Uh, we do have some guidance and a question and answer uh, that's on our website. Uh, and hopefully we can ensure that there is linkage here so, so that can be reflected on by the group. Um, but one of the key pieces, of course, is trying to maintain some HIV services within this epidemic. Of course, uh, a number of countries and, and partners want to really think about and be deliver, deliberate about the amount, the number of facility touch points um, that patients with comorbidities might have to healthcare facilities. But of course, we want to ensure that we're continuing to support and find undiagnosed people living with HIV. And particularly, again, those with known risk factors, such as diabetes, who may, as Meg hinted at, potentially be at higher risk uh, for COVID-19 complications. Of course, we also want to think about the safety of our, our, of our HTS providers um, while they're doing testing, ensuring that they have adequate PPE, think, being able to access hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, as well as potentially or hopefully physical distancing measures. And thinking about how we can adapt some of the current interventions that we use for HIV testing services to think about whether it's possible to do digitization of some of the activities, such as follow-up phone calls, videos, websites, social media, et cetera, um, in order to support um, continuing and potentially expanding HIV testing services and ensure we find and ensure we find those who are positive. And one such approach is considering uh, HIV self-testing in particular, and we have a little bit of a, a blurb on the right-hand side here, um, that it's seen as a potential alternative to maintaining services, especially because of that support in, in adhering to physical distancing, as well as minimizing the potential number of contacts that help, that, that patients and people living with HIV or those who want to be tested in going to a healthcare facility. And these can be prioritized, and we have a couple of suggestions of, of how to do so in order to fill some of those needs and gaps. And that includes distribution um, for personal use, for sexual or drug injecting partners of known already people living with HIV in social contacts of key populations, and in some high HIV burden settings, thinking about providing pregnant women with HIV self testing kits for their male partners. Some other priority oh, settings to consider include allowing the pickup at healthcare facilities or community sites, thinking about online platforms, as was hinted at before, and distribution through the mail, and then, of course, through the private enterprises like pharmacies, retail vendors, and vending machines. And so some, there are a few key pieces here around where we're currently suggesting to prioritize and adapt HTS programs. Uh, those include some of the really critical clinical services that we're considering, such as ANC, individuals who have signs and symptoms, potentially other co-infections and comorbidities, and, and of course, early infant diagnosis, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Partner index and family testing are still considered critical in order uh, to try and identify those people living with HIV. Um, increasingly, like I said, HIV self-testing and potentially restricting or pausing, pausing community outreach in some settings 
where the safety of those who would be conducting as well as those gathering to be tested might be compromised. Um, and then, sorry, Anafi, if you don't mind going back one slide, uh, maintain the linkage and referrals to ART. Anafi, do you mind going back one slide? Sorry. Thank you. Um, as well as access to condoms is, remains important and other key prevention pieces. Uh, key populations and other vulnerable, vulnerable groups who need HIV testing services as well as comprehensive sexual health services and social protection. And of course, we need to monitor and maintain a supply chain in order to reduce the amount of potential disruptions in our services. If you move to the next slide now, one key consideration that has been discussed quite a bit is around the use of molecular diagnostics technologies that we've already placed for HIV and potentially TB programs in particular to use them for COVID-19 testing. Within the, HI, within the WHO, we encourage this collaboration and sharing of the currently existing molecular diagnostics. We do, of course, want to consider and really emphasize um, that we maintain our current systems and our networks as we have them. We really need to ensure that the established systems don't be, are not disrupted uh, at the potential consequence of the future uh, HIV and testing mechanisms that have spent years to put those into place. So with that, th at current, we don't recommend um, moving equipment from currently designated laboratories or healthcare facilities to different or perhaps centralized settings in response to the COVID-19 demand. As again, we see that this will, would potentially cause significant disruptions to the current network. One key consideration uh, or a number of key considerations that we think are really important to prioritize when sharing these molecular platforms with COVID testing is number one, the importance of early infant diagnosis. It has significant morbidity and mortality challenges uh, and needs to be maintained as sharing potentially happens with COVID testing. Viral load testing will likely need to be maintained for, very, for specific populations in particular. Sorry, Anafi, can you go back one slide? And another slide, please. Thank you. Um, very, viral load testing we see as being still important for those who have advanced HIV disease, those who are suspected of failing treatment, including potentially pregnant and breastfeeding women there to minimize transmission to their infants, infants, children, and adolescents, and then of course, tuberculosis testing. And I'll leave that to Dennis to elaborate on. So just to touch on my last slide, essentially, uh, if you can move forward, Anafi, within COVID diagnostics in general, uh, not just specific to the, in the context of HIV, there have been a number of the platforms that we use within HIV and TB that have received US emergency use authorization from the FDA. Uh, and two of these have already received emergency use listing by the WHO, and those include the Roche M2000, or sorry, the Abbott M2000 and the Roche Cobas 6800 or 8800s. Um, and through some of the efforts from the WHO, a diagnostic supply consortium has been developed. And this includes the WHO, UNICEF, Global Fund, World Bank, Unitaid, Gates Foundation, FIND, and CHI. And the effort here is to try and provide access to some of these cr critical tests uh, for low and middle income countries. Discussions have progressed uh, and a number of, of access challenges and barriers have been lifted. That said, we do see limited access for all, all of these technologies in the near term and really encourage thinking about a multi-pronged testing approach where we think about inco incorporating manual testing as well as automated and broaden your automating, automated testing uh, to ensure that reliance is just not on a, on a sole piece. As available, uh, ideally we're looking to bring additional technologies into the consortium to provide greater access. We are also looking at minima or reducing our, the biosafety, the current biosafety guidance on the use of COVID testing. Um, to allow for more decentralization of testing. So those uh, programs that perhaps may be considering the Cepheid expert for COVID testing can now, ra rather than bringing their devices centrally, utilize those in a more decentralized approach. Again, considering and understanding that access to those commodities may be a little bit limited in the near term uh, as the pandemic um, affects 
multiple countries or the majority of countries right now. There are a number of guidance documents and I would really encourage you to take a look at those on the WHO website and new ones are coming on board almost daily at this rate. Um, so Nafi, I think at, at this stage we can probably stop there and I will turn it on to turn it over to my colleague Dennis uh, Falzone who leads our, our TB diagnostics work. Please Dennis go ahead. Hi everyone, thank you very much for this. Um, thank you, uh, Meg and Lara and Anafi for inviting um, the Global TV program as well. If you can move one slide, please. One more? Okay, so here we Well, that's just my introduction slide. So I belong to the Global TV program um, I'm here in Geneva. Next slide, please. I think my presentation has been a bit um, easier now that we've had the Introductions by uh, by Meg and Lara. Can you go one more slide, please? Okay, all right. So this is just to kind of to highlight that much of what I'll be saying, and unfortunately, I have to I have to leave in about ten minutes um, for another call. But much of what I say is is either on our website, which you'll find the the links there, and um, and much of it actually is is on this document that we issued couple of weeks ago on with an information note on the main issues um, touching TB. So, so <clears throat> we can go to the next slide as well and maybe I will take a few of these key questions that, uh, that we tackled in this information note which relates specifically to diagnostics and, uh, and it's great to have 400 people here um, on this call so, uh, so it's, really, it's really good to have this opportunity. So essentially this document that we've had is, is dividing into a number of key questions that we received from programs and other, and other partners that, um, that um, posed at, at this time of, of the pandemic to try to give some answers and lead to some key documents in this. So one of the key questions is what should health authorities do to provide essential services during the COVID um, pandemic? So this is really about continuing TB, <clears throat> TB services during the, the pandemic period. And I think one of the more important um, um, concepts is that the TB laboratory networks and, and platforms that countries have created, um, we, we strongly recommend that we try to leverage this in support of the COVID response, even though measures need to be taken, of course, to, to safeguard space and to continue caring for TB patients, um, just as we've heard about um, HIV as well. So next slide, please. Okay, and this other question is about, which we often get, is about the biosafety issues. And, um, and I think the document that we just saw that um, Lara showed will be updated soon to come in line with, um, with some of these notions that are here. And in, in, in essence, is that it's very important that, um, that uh, laboratory and healthcare where uh, facility staff continue to absorb, uh, observe um, TB infection prevention and control, universal precautions um, and in the diagnostic sites and the labs, it's um, critically important to, to get train, appropriate training to, to use um, universal precautions and also the supply of, um, of appropriate equipment to protect um, staff. But also very importantly, the behavior, right, about hand washing, continued use of gloves and goggles and, um, and preventive um, equipment and also uh, decontamination, um, staff distancing, avoiding um, uh, overcrowding in laboratories and ventilated workplaces um, and also important measures to take in, in transportation. So much of the um, 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 uh, safe, safe behavior that we observe in, in transportation of, laborat of laboratory specimens for TB would be adequate for, uh, for, the, for, for <clears throat> to protect against COVID-19. Also, we have some additional temporary measures there that, that have been included in the, in the note. And this is to reduce visits um, as much as possible for TB follow-up. Of course, if there is suspicion of COVID, that's another consideration. But in terms of the um, visits for TB, um, um, we, we, we recommend that we try to minimize these as much as possible. If there are visits, then they need to be done on specific days and times to avoid possibility that patients, TB patients get contaminated or else um, that there is the usual concern that um, open TB can, can infect other people. Um, also, TB medicines could be dispensed for longer periods and um, patients are supported to continue their treatment in the, 
um, with, with less frequent in-person um, visits and also the possibility to explore sputum collection at home or in open when is spaces away from the um, healthcare facility themselves and, and staff and patients. Next slide, please. Okay, so just, just a slide to emphasize the importance of universal precautions using some of the graphics that WHO has on its website. Next one, please. Okay, and this, uh, this is to address another question out, should all people being evaluated for TB also be tested for COVID-19 and vice versa? And clearly there are a number of reasons why um, this would, as the pandemic advances, why this should be more and more the case, right? Because many more people will be um, exposed or, or infected even, or, or having the disease. So, so more, one needs to consider this also in the index of suspicion, even when there is confirmation of TB. Um, and <coughs> one would need to, um, based on the clinical sort of um, response of the patient, to consider whether also to, um, to consider that patients have COVID-19 unless they have already been screened. And, and also the, the simultaneous testing for both diseases in the same person presenting for care um, needs to be considered because some clinical features are common to both diseases, like both of them are respiratory diseases, primarily they cause fever, cough, so on and so forth. So, um, and also that there may be simultaneous exposure to both diseases as the pandemic advances and, and also the risk factors for poor outcomes, why their diseases sometimes overlap, particularly in the elderly, in people with diabetes, and people with um, pre-existing lung damage from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or, or even past um, tuberculosis. Next slide, please. So I have a couple of more slides. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is just to point, build up a bit more on what uh, Lara has already said. Uh, so um, the, the question is whether um, the, the two diseases can be tested on the same type of specimen. So usually the specimens presented for TB are sputum, but of course many other specimens can be used. While for COVID-19, the classical um, testing is done on nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal swabs. Um, sputum testing for COVID can be done, of course, but, uh, but this would require other tests and usually is done in a, in a more sort of um, an intensive environment like, like using bronchoscopy or inpatient care. Um, <clears throat> so uh, clearly, so this means that the routing of the specimen needs to be um, different very often. Yeah. Um, diagnostic testing, um, however, using molecular techniques is the currently recommended method for both conditions to diagnose the infectious forms of both conditions and serology is not recommended. And uh, we have these three tests which are, have currently been approved by WHO for procurement on the WHO EUL um, listing. So, so there's, the <clears throat> there's the Roche system and the, the Abbott system, but also another system on Z-Path. Um, and, <clears throat> and the next slide, please. So this, this list is updated regularly. So there are a number of diagnostics which are on the, on the list, which have been submitted to WHO PQ for consideration. Um, and I think one of them, which is on this list and not yet approved, but have, has already received the US FDA um, EUA for use in, um, in mesopharyngeal swabs and desperates, um, um, et cetera, is, is, but not for sputum is the express cartridge um, for, for SARS-CoV-2. And, um, and it is still being assessed by WHO. We are waiting some more detail from the, um, from the um, manufacturer. And the, the importance of this um, testing methodology is that it would run on the gene expert machines, which have been deployed primarily in many, in many settings, in many decentralized settings, primarily out of a drive to improve um, TB. Testing and so one concern would be, of course, that some of this um, space uh, uh, would, that that is used nowadays for testing of um, of TB could be taken up um, by COVID testing, and we need to ensure that while providing facilities right for COVID testing, um, that we do not displace the or, or delay testing essential testing for for TB. So I think this is an important um, concept, and countries need to see what is necessary to build up capacity and mobilize more resources and avoid the displacing machines that are primarily intended for 
PB testing away from that, um, that purpose. Um, yeah, so next slide, I think that's more or less uh, a lot of what um, I had to say, okay. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I will have to leave soon. So if there are some questions, um, maybe we can handle them by email eventually. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dennis, um, for, for that uh, wonderful presentation, and we appreciate you taking time off your busy schedule. Um, we will capture any of the questions that are maybe coming after you've gone and send them to you. Um, without taking much time, um, and also a reminder that enter your questions into the chat box, our next um, presenter is uh, um, from Dr. George Alemji, who is the Senior Technical Advisor for Laboratory Services at the State um, Department for the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, uh, OGAC, uh, and the Health Diplomacy from US. Um, George, uh, over to you. Hello, George. Yeah, I'm there. Try to like to share my screen. I'm on it. So, are you seeing it now? Yes, you can. Then put on presentation mode. Okay. So, am I there? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Good. Good. Um. Okay. Uh. Thank you so much, Anafi, and the entire ASLM team for giving me this opportunity to share some of the issues that we have to consider to ensure coordinated HIV, TB, and uh, uh, COVID-19 testing, particularly um, what we are thinking within the PEPFAR space and what um, we are sharing with um, our colleagues in various countries. Uh, let's move to my next uh, slide, is, which is just um, uh, giving a, a rundown of the things that I'll be talking about, uh, definitely, uh, we do uh, recognize that there will be some impact on the TB and HIV testing with uh, the event of uh, COVID-19. And of course, I would just want to share some highlights on the sort of initial capacity that has been supported for COVID-19 testing by WHO and uh, African CDC. And of course, uh, we'll be talking about what do we need to do to ensure that this coordination moves forward and then nothing is left behind. And of course, there will be time for me to share uh, some take-home messages and the question and answers. My next uh, slide, um, of course, again, as I, said, as I said earlier, the advent of uh, COVID uh, will definitely uh, uh, present some barriers and challenges to the HIV testing that may eventually uh, impact the, the care continuum and, the, of course, the UNS 1990 targets. Uh, if we don't work collaboratively. Uh, the fact that there is uh, already quarantine, social distancing, uh, community containment, of course, do have impact because movement is uh, limited. We're talking about really, really reduction in terms of uh, timely linkage to HIV care services. Um, hospital visits will be impacted. And of course, again, that is uh, going to affect facilities and movement of both uh, patients and samples. And of course, uh, there's some background noise. Should I continue? Uh, please, if you are not speaking, just let me just try to mute or then unmute you. Okay, thank you. So again, things like, of course, or HIV prevention services, things that require movement and sharing of material, the condom, the lubricant would definitely be affected in a way. And of course, looking at the typical, the testing services, which is, I think, is the call of our presentation, uh, things like our routine HIV serology and self-testing that we know require other uh, participant moving or staff moving, of course, will be impacted. Molecular diagnostics for viral load, EID, HIV drug resistance, and TB. All of course, my colleagues from WHO have already said a lot about that. And of course, um, allocation of resources. Now that COVID is up and COVID is really, really something we want to deal with urgently, there's evidence that, of course, there may be some relocation of uh, funding that uh, was initially meant for HIV to now be used to support COVID. So those are the sort of things that we would definitely be seeing uh, down the road. 
So again, uh, just my next slide is uh, again, if I move to the next slide, which has the map of Africa. Just uh, when uh, COVID came up, it was this very, very important initiative by the African uh, cent uh, uh, Centers for Disease Control, uh, CDC, uh, working with WHO that uh, sent uh, staff from, I think, from two countries to Senegal where they were trained on COVID diagnosis. I think that has been great. If we hear about testing of COVID going on in Africa, I think this is the base of it. And I think they have that capacity moving forward. But at this point, um, if you just take us to my next slide, um, this uh, support actually came uh, through, I think, uh, test kits that came from Germany and that's called the open source platform, not yet this sort of, uh, platform that we use for HIV work, which I'll mention later. So this has been going on, but there's need for expansion. We hear that testing is not yet happening in Africa as should, which means there's literally need to cascade testing to other levels. So um, how do we do that? Of course, my next slide is really, uh, looking into what should we be considering to ensure that this coordinated uh, testing. Um, something is, I only want to be seeing the, the, the slide so I can give you the slide numbers. Maybe let me move here. Okay, I'm really on, on slide um, number uh, eight. So just be sure we are on the same page. So um, the most important thing we need to consider is to use existing resources. Uh, over the years, we know that WHO, Global Fund, PEFA, and all these international stakeholders and countries have supported um, African countries in really, really building infrastructure, lab capacity, and so on. This is the time that we should leverage those existing resources to also ensure that we accommodate uh, COVID testing. We should not go somewhere looking for resources when they are in-house. So my next uh, slide, of course, is um, the notion of the diagnostic integration approach. I think this is the way we go. Uh, WHO has been pushing this forward. And Lara just a couple of days shared with us this uh, report that uh, came out of the meeting we attended in Geneva. That was uh, July 10 to 12 last year, where there was a lot of discussion and best practices shared from other countries that have actually implemented the diagnostic integrated approaches that work so well. So I think that is a way that we have to move forward in all our testing, not just for COVID, but anything that concerns diagnostics should be looked at it holistically. So I move to slide number 10, which is again, uh, moving to a component, very, very important component of the diagnostic integration called the multiplex use of platforms. I think this is where we are now. As I said earlier, uh, testing for COVID has been happening wow. using the open source. But now, as you've heard, um, uh, um, FDA has uh, approved some platforms to do what we call emergency use authorization. And Lara also mentioned that WHO is moving forward. But this particular slide is showing us just an example of a couple of those platforms. And we are not here to brand any product, but we just want to pick a couple of those ones that uh, do interact so much with our HIV diagnostics. If you think about something like the Roche and the Abbott that we've used traditionally for viral load and EID, of course, they are also now to be used for um, COVID testing. All logic is also same. And of course, the gene expert again over the years has been the, the platform for TB, uh, more recently for HIV, but again for COVID. So just having this sort of menu of platforms together, we have to employ the principles of multiplexing to see how we can coordinately use all these platforms to support both HIV, TB, and COVID um, at the same time. Just lay uh, down on the, my slide, of course, the solarology that we know over the years we set up very, very good HIV solarological systems. Now again, we are hearing about the COVID solarology, the use of antibodies and setting up surveillance system and so on. All this is going to happen in the midst of routine HIV solarology. So we need to be careful and ensure that this happens in a manner in such a way that no particular activity is being impacted. So my very next slide is T again, emphasizing the needs for integration. Over the years, countries have good sample transport systems. This is not a time to go and reinvent the way and start something separate or parallel for COVID. Please use those existing systems, use the same implementing partners and then move forward. That is what we need to be doing. I was thinking about doing at this time. My next slide, number 12, is again, see talking about the data system. Good data systems are out there. Most of, almost the instruments we use today have connectivity, dashboards have been established. 
and we keep on hearing about laboratory surveillance system. We need to improve these systems. We need to ensure that assistance to quickly report as, um, as COVID and also ensure that other diseases are supported. Use the sort of case-based surveillance system that have been established for HIV, if that is what we want to do. But it should not be something new. It should be just using existing systems. I move to the next uh, slide, which is again very, very important, the need for us to address biosafety and waste management. Now, WHO uh, reports that uh, during the 2014 West African Ebola outbreak, about 10% of those who died were healthcare workers. And uh, it did not stop there. They also report saying that some of these healthcare workers actually uh, took this infection back home and infected their families. So this is something that we need to address seriously. We've received or we read a lot of reports just on COVID, talking about healthcare workers dying, both um, clinical staff, facilities, and laboratory staff, at the line of their duties. So we have to make sure that all biosafety and waste management issues are carefully addressed. Uh, systems should be in place for waste disposal. We hear there are a lot of challenges with uh, PPEs that are not there. Please, please, this is what you should consider seriously and ensure that they're in place and not expose your staff to unnecessarily risky situations. My next slide, again, slide number 14, is uh, really talking about some of the COVID-19 mitigation strategies. I'm just trying to repeat um, what you already know. Uh, Lara might have mentioned some of this in her slide. But again, you want to consider options for timing and collection of specimens that allow for social distances. People should not come together many at the same time. Consider reduce wait time for sample collection. We want to do that fast so that the, the participant leaves for another person to come in. Avoid crowded waiting rooms. This is not time for business as usual. Things are not uh, looking good. Uh, of course, consider rescheduling or, or things like staggered appointments so that people don't come in at the same time. Then, of course, workflow. This is something that you have to change your really traditional workflow in terms of movement for patients or sample collection and your routine staff. Probably you want to create an additional door for them to come in and move just to where there's a flambectomy for samples to be collected or something like that. But again, avoid people coming across or meeting with each other. And I think this is a very, very important time where we really want to see how we can make use of our mobile testing, both for our HIV and COVID. The use of the point of care platforms, again, this is really where you want to decentralize and you want to get people closer together. Community identified testing as much as possible is what is going to help. More so when people are not even moving because of the lockdown. Okay, my next slide, of course, is the supply chain. This is huge. We heard this all the time and we're struggling with it up to this moment. You know, there's lockdown at both levels, both in terms of the production countries and receiving countries. We hear uh, China is locked down, India is locked down, and if China start producing, those products can move. I see Sorry, um, okay, maybe someone just, please, again, those samples can move, so we, we have to make sure there are system in place in, to address them. I know at this point, uh, PEPFA and Global Fund, and I think the UNICEF, they're thinking about chartered flight. These are things that have to be addressed in times like this. And of course, even in the receiving countries, sometimes the airports are not for working, the warehouse is closed and so on. And of course, these products have to move. So again, you have to address that. I, I will quickly move to the last bullet um, on this slide which is to me is very, very important. We need to consider the notion of essential workers and really, really classify your laboratory staff, supply chain and all the other staff to fall into this category. They need additional mm. support at this time. There's lockdown, there may not be transportation to work. So think about arranging for additional transportation for them. It could be, could they be using the ambulance services or police vehicles or the military, but think about how to provide them with that additional support. Also accommodation, you want to avoid them moving in and out. Uh, again, you want to prevent infection from home to work and work to home. Uh, if you can have like a hotel lodging, accommodation for them just to make sure that someone come in and spend one or two days or more before returning home, that could be very, very helpful. It could make them more efficient and also reduce the risk of um, subsequent transmission. So I move to slide number six, which is again, very, very important here. The need to strengthen collaboration. We saw this uh, during the, the West African Ebola outbreak where initially there was some lack of coordination and things happened in a very, very uncoordinated manner. Let us not repeat that mistake. 
um, we want to make sure we have a coordinated discussion on how we engage the, the diagnostic manufacturers. We've received complaints from manufacturers that they are receiving multiple calls from multiple people on requesting for the same information in such a way that if we work together, that would be different. I saw a slide from um, uh, Lara where they talk about this consortium set together by WHO. I think that is the way to go. Everyone needs to work in that sort of a group and ensure that quantification issues, procurement issues, and even negotiation of the unit costs. We've said the way to go should be the region renter and the all-inclusive pricing. All that has to be discussed within the group and then have a better chance and opportunity to negotiate with the suppliers on how to procure. Also, HRO issues are very, very important. You are now dealing with staff who are not the staff that you normally support and also the instrumentation. We want to make sure that everyone is around the table when these decisions are made so that nothing is impacted. My slide number 17 is just a couple of things. I think that um, Lara covered this. a need to really prioritize at this time, particularly for your viral load. Um, it's not business as usual. I want to think about what are the critical populations that we know from our past work that really, really need more support in terms of scale up for viral load testing. And Laura mentioned almost what I have here in terms of pregnant and breastfeeding women, infants and children, uh, those with advanced diseases and so on. And of course, uh, you note again here that we don't need viral load results to, for any transition to TLD. So um, this is not something that should be impacted uh, moving forward. My next slide, uh, slide number 18, is just same thing about the need to prioritize this time in terms of the HTS services. Again, I don't want to repeat what um, Lara said, but again, you really have to look at your program and see what is priority here, who should we be attending uh, in terms of needs and reach out, like uh, she explained, we should be looking at population that in our routine work are critical for us to diagnose first. Slide number 19, which I think probably is my very, very last slide, is again just a summary of um, what I've been saying earlier, that we have to take all measures to ensure that uh, increase in COVID testing uh, does not negatively impact existing HIV and TB uh, testing. And to do this, there need to be some coordinated activities here. And most important is the need for everyone to have developed an SOP to guide how this is going to happen. We must document all our strategies and do that among all the stakeholders with leadership from the home government so that everyone understands what is happening at each stage. Uh, we are really hoping that at this point, uh, countries have already done this. If not, then I think um, they may be late because what we hear is that already the reagents for the platforms I mentioned earlier, the Abbott, the Roche, and so on, have started arriving countries, which means moving forward from here, things are going to be different, not just the open source platform. Some programs want to, or countries want to expand testing, and of course, start using this platform. So there's a need for sort of guidelines, SOPs, to ensure how we work together to support the use of these platforms. They're definitely going to be increased in common uh, instrumentation and consumables and PPEs. All that has to be adjust adjusted or uh, where defined in the, in, the, in the SOPs. And of course, this is time for you to think about adjustment of time management because routinely you have staff that come to work in the morning and leave by four o'clock. Of course, there's need for work shift now. You may have to provide additional training for some of your staff and also consider extended hours and overtime. All that has to happen or should have happened before now because I'm sure this week and other weeks coming, there's going to be a lot of involvement of both COVID and the HIV testing within the same laboratory. So consider that, of course, the, the integrated approach I mentioned together and also addressing a supply chain and also the need for uh, consideration for essential uh, workers and, and of course, again, coordination among all the stakeholders. So um, I will stop at this point. Again, I'm really thankful to the SLM for giving us a opportunity to share these uh, guidelines or information with the rest of the, the entire community. So thank you so much and uh, I'm ready to respond to any of your questions. Over. Uh, thank you, George, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we want to move straight into the question and answer. Uh, so I'll ask you just to stop uh, sharing. Um, as we start uh, to take the first question here, I also want to bring in uh, Wayne uh, uh, Van Hemet from the Stop TB Partnership to perhaps respond to this one and also give us um, a bit of uh, um, 
uh, background as to uh, the new considerations for selecting uh, diagnostic tests that they uh, have also shared in the recent past. The question is about what does it take to ensure the gene expert machine accommodates investigation of COVID-19 without interrupting TB assays uh, routinely? Uh, so Wayne, are you, are you there? Uh, maybe you could take this one and, and provide also remarks on, on the same subject. Sure. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Anafi, for allowing me to make a few remarks. Um, so as Anafi said, I'm Wayne Van Gemmerts. I'm with the Stop TB Partnership in Geneva. Um, I don't want to repeat what the previous colleagues and presenters already said, and I fully agree and support what Laura and Dennis and George were all saying about the need to continue um, testing, especially for TB. So I'll just add a couple things. Firstly, as a resource, uh, we at Stop TB published um, very recently for countries considerations for selection of SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics, um, as well as potential multiplexing. You can find it on our Stop TB webpage, um, on our TB and COVID page, but I'm also going to paste the link into the chat box in a moment. We published this mainly as a perspective to ensure continuity of testing for TB, given the very large interest in using gene experts for COVID testing. And of course, we need to be mindful that the expert MTB RIF test is in most cases, currently at least, the only molecular test being used for TB testing in most countries and, and people with TB are going to suffer if that testing is stopped or reduced. One of the main points of our document is to encourage countries to consider multiple options, given not only what equipment they may already have in place, including gene experts, but also considering the actual availability of getting tests onto the ground. Um, as Laura, I think, already mentioned, there's definitely high demand for the Cephid COVID cartridges, which is understandable, but countries need to understand that they may not be able to access the needed number of tests within their, their needed time frame. Um, we do encourage countries, um, if they are planning to use the Cephid COVID cartridges, that they should be carefully estimating how much free capacity is available on existing instruments. And in order to meet the required testing capacity, they should consider buying more machines as well as expanding working hours of staff, um, of course, with commensurate payments. Um, and we strongly discourage any countries um, to centralize the gene experts um, to facilitate the SARS-CoV-2 testing um, because to ensure initiation of TB treatment, this really requires minimizing turnaround times for testing. Um, and as Lara Voinoff said earlier, the biosafety requirements around COVID testing are going to be relaxed. So there's, there's really no purpose in, in centralizing the machines for that purpose. So I'll stop there. Thanks for allowing me to make these remarks. And uh, you can see in the chat box, I'm going to post in a moment, uh, the considerations document that we at Stop2B recently published. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Um, I'll take the next question. Um, I acknowledge those that have lifted their hands, uh, but I guess I think it might be fair for us to take questions that are in the chat box. Uh, I think it will be uh, um, So the next question is from Aloysius uh, Tusime, um, and he says, with most countries on lockdown and travel restrictions, how has WHO worked with governments to make sure vulnerable HIV and TB continue to receive uh, services like testing and treatment. Uh, Lara? Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. It looks like we may have lost uh, Meg Doherty. I think she probably would have been uh, the better person as she's managing that side of our work in terms of, of trying to support governments um, through the WHO as well as with partners um, to ensure minimized obviously stigma and discrimination uh, amongst groups including those just being diagnosed with COVID as well as those with HIV um, and we're really trying to work together with governments and, and partners to come together with a set of sort of priority interventions that should be maintained um, during this this pandemic across countries um, we feel that that's, that's critical um, and, and will only benefit and, and support um, the systems that have already been in place. So we're trying to work hard to, to do so. I think we'd be open and interested and are interested in feedback, um, but it is a challenging time and we're trying to find ways to navigate around that. Thank, thank you, Lara. Um, I'll take the next uh, question. Um, and um, it 
It is from, I think are, these are two, so I'll group them together. Um, uh, from Kritika Dixit, hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. What are the plans to ensure adequate supply of TB uh, diagnostic tests such as cartridges and medicines? And then I'll combine it with um, O'Brien Nolubanda, who says, what are the, some of the specific measures that can be taken to ensure that viral load samples, sample inflow continues amidst the COVID? Maybe George, you can go for that one. Yeah, um, thank you. And I feel, uh, let me respond to the viral load question. Um, well, uh, Lara says uh, she's part of the consortium can respond to the around the, the, the TB. Yeah, so we get, it said it's a challenge here because of lockdown. Uh, as I said earlier, um, there need to be uh, systems in place to address this. Uh, it's at country level. We don't know to ex the extent to which the problem is out there. But again, um, you know your patients, you know their locations and the clinics and where they go to. So that is why I'm saying it could be some of the assistance in terms of sample transport system so that they're able to get to the clinics for the samples to be collected. It should be assisted uh, samples transfer system for the samples to move to the laboratory for testing and so on. So this is all at country level and the extent of the lockdown is a little bit uh, different from different countries and different settings. But again, you have to look at your patient and make sure you don't lose touch with the key uh, patients based on our prioritization in terms of who needs your support most. Um, call them. Uh, Lara gave a lot of examples how things can change. Use the S SMS to report results back and improve communication uh, using other methods that uh, usually you don't use in your routine uh, testing uh, programs. So uh, maybe Lara, you can, if you can take uh, over and talk about the, the gene expert. Stuff. Great. Thanks, George. That's a terrific answer. I won't add anything to that. Um, on the continued supply, I, I think the question was mostly focused on the HIV and TB cartridges, uh, but within the consortium effort, we, and we, I, I, when I say we, I mean the entire consortium, are working with the suppliers to try and ensure some sort of maintenance of the HIV and TB cartridges during this time. As you can understand and imagine, uh, these cartridges are very similar in sort of manufacturing type to the HIV and HIV, TB, and COVID cartridges are all quite similar, and so we want to ensure that those um, additional tests are continuing to be manufactured. There could be potentially some restrictions in the inability to expand testing or to expand the number of cartridges, um, but we are, we are trying to incorporate that within the conversations and negotiations. Uh, on the COVID consideration for access, I know that's a big issue. Wayne touched on it just now as well. We have heard a lot of excitement across countries to try and access this test. Um, you can imagine that given the current status of the pandemic that essentially all 194 member states um, are, look, are seeking access, have pandemics potentially, or a number of them do, some significant obviously still in North America and Western Europe. And so even though we can consider that test um, to support our COVID-19 testing, uh, it's unlikely that, at least in the near term, over the next few months, that access will be able to meet the demand. Uh, number one, it's obviously challenging for suppliers to generate that type of, that amount of, of uh, tests, but also distribution can be quite challenging and exportation. So um, we are continuing to work with all of the suppliers um, that we've been discussing and trying to see how we can ensure and expand access in low and middle income countries. And I know there is one quick question in Afi just on the timing of that. Um, and some publications and, and guidance should be coming out over the next few days. And we're really looking forward to um, moving the consortium forward towards ensuring access to yes. those tests in country shortly. Uh, thank you, Lara. Uh, and I think you, also touched uh, a, a response to one of the questions I was going to take. Uh, it's more of a comment, but I think it's very important from Giza Chu, uh, who had said um, he or she thinks this virus will stay as, with us for some time and any long-term plan need to be anticipated soon. Um, so I will just take one last question probably, uh, which he has been recurring, and it has to do with the biosafety uh, uh, levels. Uh, and say, is there any evidence about possibility to relax biosafety measures 
as I know, BSAO2 is needed for RNA uh, extraction stage from uh, the specimen for COVID-19. That is deactivating the samples with UV light, uh, ETC. Uh, and I think this question has been asked by many, many. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, and we touched on it really briefly earlier, but um, here within the, the WHO, uh, we did have guidance that came out a couple of weeks ago suggesting COVID testing um, and pretty strict biosafety standards in a BSL-2 facility. Uh, we are actually very near completion of updated guidance on that specific topic. And it looks like we should be able to lift that strict restriction um, and, and allow for decentralization or non-BSL2 labs to be able to do testing as well. So that hopefully will be able to allow expansion of testing uh, across a number of your countries. Uh, thank, thank you, Lara. Um, yeah, we have reached the top of the hour. Um, we realize, I think, uh, questions are many, and uh, as usual, we, we, we are capturing these, and I think we'll be sharing with you together with the session slides uh, and the recording, and we also now have those for previous sessions ready to be shared as well. Uh, just to also mention that, um, as mentioned by George and uh, Lara, the diagnostic integration meeting report is there. I think a lot of lessons uh, to be learned in there. We hope you are able to be able to get it. Uh, we will still further disseminate. Uh, and, and, and for you, stakeholders and government, stakeholders and government. to influence uh, policy change uh, uh, in this direction. So just to thank uh, everybody for coming through uh, and our wonderful presenters for sharing uh, their wealth of knowledge. And we continue uh, to provide this platform to continue to learn together uh, as we know, we try to fight uh, this uh, pandemic. Uh, a quick announcement tomorrow, uh, again, another hot topic that has been coming in previous sessions uh, on serology testing. So we are going to be having also a rich panel of uh, presenters uh, experienced in the field. We are going to talk about serology and what is the, what is the evidence for and what is the evidence for against uh, serology as we try to fight this pandemic. Till we meet tomorrow, um, I think it will be one hour from now. Uh, yes, around 4 p.m. Uh, at this Ababa time. Uh, have a good day, good evening, good morning, and uh, good night for those that are in the 